Well, the common thread to me looks like every church she goes into, she gets mad at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. And while you find that, I'll tell you that when I was a youth pastor, I became a youth pastor when I was just 19 years old. And uh, this young man came to youth group. We were uh, running around my brother's neighborhood and my neighborhood, and we were uh, inviting all the kids we could invite to come to youth group. And if they had friends, we would go to their friends and invite them. And so it regularly happened that children would come or teens would come to a youth group, but their parents didn't come to church. And so I kind of made it a practice that whenever a young person would come to the youth group, I would get in my car and I would drive them home that day because half the time I drove them there to begin with. And so I'd drive them home that night and I would meet with his parents or her parents or whoever and we would sit and talk with them. And, and uh, so this was just kind of a practice we had. And so I didn't realize how much I would hear this. Now I've heard this several times, but this was the first time it ever happened. I was about 19 years old or so and I went to this boy's house. He had come to the youth group and I drove to his house and his mom opened up the door. The first thing she said to me is, I will never come to your church. It's like that conviction kind of like sets in and she said, I'll never come to your church. And I said, well, that's okay. Like we're not here to necessarily ask you to come to church, though we would like to have you come to church. And so foolishly, I've learned not to ask this anymore. Like people tell me that. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to get into it with them. But, I, but her, I, did, I didn't know at that time. And so I asked her the question. I said, uh, I said, well, why? Like, what, why don't you want to come to church? And she gave me this whole story about how the, the abbreviated version is that how uh, when she had been young, she had been in some church and they had wronged her in some way, not physically harmed her in any way, but they, they had emotionally harmed her in some way and offended her. And so she left. And, and then when she was just married, she her and her husband decided they wanted to go back to church and sure enough they went to church and the church hurt them again and and church is just that's all the church is ever doing is hurting people and so I tried to share with her my personal testimony and things that happened with me in church and I tried to get her to come I said you know there's church is different it's not you know our church is different than that you don't have to expect that from every church but she never came two years went by she never darkened the door of the church not once her kid was in a Christmas play. She didn't come. Literally never would come. We'd drive out, pick him up, and we'd bring him to church, and we'd take him home. And one day that boy, was he was getting quite big. He was not really a boy anymore. And uh, we were playing this little silly game in the, in the fellowship hall of the church. And this girl went running, and he was getting heated about the game. And the boy stood up, and he clotheslined the girl and knocked her straight on her back. And without hesitation, I said, get out. Go. Get out. I'll, I'll, I'll call your mom later. Go. Well, here's this big 215-pound teenage boy crying his eyes out and runs out of the building. And he didn't just go out of the fellowship hall. He left the church and ran home. And before we could get to church service, we always had youth and then church after. Uh, and so before we could get to church service that, that night, guess who was there at the church wagging her finger in my face, telling me that the church wasn't any different. And I tried to say, no, you don't understand. Your son clotheslined a girl and knocked her on her bottom, and, and now, you know, you're... You're wagging your finger in my face, but she just, you know, you're no different than anybody else. You're just trying to hurt people. You know, that's all churches ever do. And I tried to warn my son not to come here. And now look at what you've done. And eh, she just ran her mouth at me. And in the moment at, at 19 or 20, yeah, at that point I was like 21 or whatever, 22, I was pretty devastated. Yeah, I remember hanging my head in shame thinking, you know, like, I've just, this lady will never go to church now. And her son, he'll never, he'll probably never go back to church. And, and my pastor pulled me to the side and he said, Justin, he said, you're, you're going to have to get used to this if you're going to be in ministry. And this is what he said. He said, I want you to look at the common thread in all of this. And I said, well, the common thread is it seems like she feels like every church she ever goes in, they hurt her. And he said, well, the common thread to me looks like every church she goes into, she gets mad at. I know there's an ouch there for a moment, but he was right. The common thread that was happening, the thing that was happening was every time she found herself in a church, she was looking for something to be mad at. I'm going to tell you something from the onset today. You ready for this? If you want to find a problem with us, there's plenty. Start with me. You're going to find a lot. Like if you want to find sin or unrighteousness, if you want to find, if you want to find bad management, if you, want to find, so if you want to find it, look for it. You don't need a microscope. Just get to know me. I'll, I'll, I'll mess up. Right? I mean, it won't take very long. I'll say something stupid. I'll do something stupid. And if you're not looking at me, if you're looking at our members, they're going to do it too. We're all going to do something wrong. That's what happens. I want to talk to you today, and it's not just mine. It's what Paul says. I want to show you today. I almost named the sermon how to be, at, how to be happy in church, but I, I changed that because directly from the text, Paul uses the word peace, and I thought that was a better fit. But really the truth is I want to show you today that, that we don't have to set our mind on what the church is doing wrong. Let's look at what Paul says when he, when he talks about this church. Remember this church, brand new church, that when he had planted them just three weeks 
that he had been able to be there with them. Look what he tells them. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. Are you there? Okay. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer about His Word. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you in Jesus' precious and holy name and we ask you to fill this place. Lord, I must admit to you that sometimes I feel foolish that you would ever call me to speak. I thank you for the privilege. I don't deserve it, Father. I pray that you would speak to me as much as you would speak to everyone else in this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. I pray that your word would, would become anew to us again. I pray, Father, that we would see your word in a new light and we wouldn't just see it and hear it and walk out of here and forget who we are, but, Father, that we would see your word, we would see our own lives, and, Father, that we would leave here changed for you. We pray that your word would speak to our hearts. And we pray that your spirit would just fill this place. Whatever decisions you have, Father, whatever you want to do in this time of worship, in this time of preaching your word. Father, I pray that you would do it. Let your will be done. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look, it's verse 12. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and those who are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, I see three things there. I'm not going to divide all three, uh, purposefully not going to divide all three, because we'll, we'll end up spending all, all day there. Uh, but, but notice what he says. He, he divides these up. He says, there's those who labor among you. Recognize those who labor, those who are over you, and those who admonish you. Now, in a small church, those overlap quite a bit. We, we have that often. There was this old lady that came to our church for a long time. Some of you know who I'm uh, referencing. And she refused to clap in church. And I don't mean like during a song, like rhythmically. I mean that if you got up and you sang a song, and then if the, if the crowd clapped at the end of that song, she was offended by that. And, and she would say, her exact words to me would be this, that when we clap, we take it from worship to a performance. And then she would say that if we clap, this is what she would tell me. She said, I, I don't want to steal anyone else's reward. And she would reference the Pharisees who would pray in front of people. And if they prayed in front of people and they, get, they had their reward, you know, they, they wanted to show everybody that they were fasting and praying and so they had their reward. And I used to try to tell her often, I would say, you know, that's not really the way that it is. The, the Lord looks at our heart. And if your heart is to worship him and like, let's go from the other side. This is the example I gave her one time. I said, let's go from the other side. Let's say someone gets up in church and they sing a song and their heart really is to worship God. They didn't ask for anybody to clap. They didn't ask for anyone to, they, they just wanted to worship the Lord. And that's what they were doing. They were singing and they were worshiping. But the whole group erupts in an applaud at the end of the song. Is God up in heaven and went, well, I had a blessing for you, but they all clapped. Sorry, they all messed that up for you. Like we were, there was going to be a new, there was going to be a new diadem in the crown, but I mean, they all, you got your reward, they clapped. Does that sound foolish to you if I say it in the, from those terms? And in the other way, do you think if someone got up and wanted everyone's applaud and wanted everyone's, if, if my heart really was, if I got in front of everyone and I, I began to sing and, and my, my desire was that everyone would clap, but if the whole room didn't, if the whole room was silent like Baptists are used to doing, if we were, that was a joke, if we're all just totally quiet and we're totally silent, do you think that the Lord was like, well, I mean, his heart was in the wrong place, but they didn't clap. I got to give him something. Do, do you get to manipulate the rewards of God that way? It doesn't work that way, does it? So look at what Paul said. This is scriptural, not me. What does he say? What's the first word? We urge you, brethren, to do what? You're supposed to do something. Recognize those who labor among you. 
I didn't ask him for permission. Sorry. Uh, but that's okay. There, there are people in our church that labor among us. And sometimes they do it without ever going noticed. And I'm going to tell some stories today, and I, I should, I'm supposed to ask. Like, I remember seminary told me I'm supposed to ask people before I do that, but I didn't. So, Sherry, I'm, I'm going to start with Sherry, because I know Sherry's not going to leave. She's not going to get mad at me no matter what I say. So, <laughs> so listen, I want to tell you a story about Sherry. Sherry came to our church. Do you know how long? Some of y'all waiting to join. You want to know how long it took Sherry to join our church? One Sunday, okay? Anyways, that's a whole different thing. But so, Sherry came one time. At the end of service, have y'all ever seen the movie Cars? You know cars, right? There's like these little cars, and the, and the cars are like they're in a little podunk uh, ghost town. And then when somebody was driving by, they were like, places! That was our church. There was like 12 people. I think there was probably eight people that day actually in the church. Seven of those were probably my family. And so we're like just hardly anybody, and Sherry comes. And so when she pulls in the parking lot, we're all like, don't act weird! <laughs> but, Sherry comes in, and, and we, I'm telling you, like, it was, it was rough. And Sherry came in, and, we, and I walked out. I'm, I'm following her like a, like a puppy. You know, like when a puppy thinks he's found a friend. Like, I'm following her out to the parking lot, and, and I'm trying to talk with her. And she looks over her car at Maddie, and Maddie was about, mm, she's probably 10 years old, maybe 11. And she looked over the car at Maddie, her daughter, and she said, Maddie, do you like it here? And Maddie went, yeah. And she said, you want to call it home? Maddie said, yeah. She said, we're going to join. We'll, we'll be back. And she got in her car and she left. That's just Sherry's personality. Like, I didn't know her at the time. Not that well. And, and Sherry's been here for seven years ever since. And I, I want to tell you some stuff, and I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I hope she'll, she'll understand what I'm trying to get at here. When Sherry came to our church, what a lot of you don't know is that Sherry was widowed. And what you don't know is that even sometimes when she was here every Sunday, playing the piano, picking up music for us, helping us out in a place that we were needed. Sometimes there were memories of her husband who had been in the same building where we were meeting. And then even more than that, sometimes there would be like anniversary dates. And for those of you who've lost someone close to you, you know what I'm talking about. There'd be these anniversary dates that they would come by. And she never called in. Never once did she ever call me and say, I just can't do it today. My emotions are too high. I can't be there. She's there every time. And then even this past week, you know what happened when she was widowed? Then she had to get a full-time job. Her whole life is, is changing in the midst of that. Her daughter's gone off to college. And then here she is this past Wednesday. She's working like 12, 13, 14-hour days for the Louisville Science Center. And she got done with that. And you know who was here Wednesday night for Bible study? Sherry came here. And then after Bible study, we stayed late and we sang songs. We practiced for this morning. And then when we were done practicing those songs, she said, Okay, guys, with a smile on her face and never a complaint. You know what she said? She said, let's practice for Christmas. And so we sang Christmas carols, practicing for the, for the Christmas season that's coming. I'm going to give you another one. We've got a deacon. Some of you say, why do you only have one deacon? Because we've got a real good one. <laughs> we're growing, guys. Work with us here. Like, we're getting there. We've got one deacon right now. It's because we were real small. I mean, today's crowd's a little small, but, but we've, we've been smaller. Like, this, is, this isn't too bad. I'm just warning you. And so Tom is our deacon, and... and uh, I'm just going to tell you this, that I've never met anybody who's on chemotherapy who comes up to the church while he's on chemo. You know what the man did this past week? I know, I didn't ask you, Tom. You can keep your head down. It's fine. I'm going to tell him anyways. He went outside and he dug down four foot on three sides of the building and he tarred the outside of the building and put plastic on it because we were leaking in the basement. And then he turned around and he dug up the two trees. We had some incidents with kids getting on the playground and, incident and some issues with insurance. And so he dug up the two trees that were out front and he put them to block the opening so that we'd be okay with our insurance because we had openings where kids could get in behind the fence. And then I'm standing here today and he replaced the lights in the foyer. I'm going to tell you a true statement. We had a, a, another person in our church that was in the hospital for a surgery. Tom was going in for his chemo treatment and went wandering the hospital to go find the other person and pray with them before his own chemo treatment. I, right, I'm telling you, I want to tell you some good things. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get you to understand something for a moment. That Listen, you've got singers.
that come every week and they stay Wednesday night and they stay late and they get here early on Sunday morning and they sing and they never ask for a thing. There's people that come up and they clean the church and they clean the windows and they set things up and they get things ready for our fall festival or for whatever outing or whatever we're having and they put things together. They never ask for a thing. They don't fight. They don't bicker. They come and they work in the kitchen and they prepare food for us. We've got a new youth minister that's driving all the way down from Lexington. You understand? He's driving from Lexington to come here and, and already has it set in his mind of maybe possibly moving here when he gets done with school in May. I'm trying to tell you this. This is what I, this is what I want to say to you for a moment. Look at, what, look at what Paul said. You want to learn how to be at peace in church, how to be happy in church? Look at what Paul said. We urge you, brethren, recognize those who labor among you. The truth is that the truth about most churches is that 90% of the people don't do anything. Like that's true. The truth, the truth of most churches is that 10% of the people do 90% of the work. I would challenge you that in our church we're a little different than that. Most everybody who comes in our church wants to work and they want to serve. And we've got a church full of workers. Don't get to the point. Let me, let me go from the opposite side for just a minute and tell you what we, what we do sometimes. Sometimes as churchgoers what we do is we like to... We like to, mm, well, we like to complain. Sometimes. We would, we never, like, nobody would ever be like, yeah, I like to complain. You may not say you like to complain, but you complain. I complain. Like, we do it sometimes, right? Something didn't go the way we liked it. Somebody didn't sing the song that they wanted to, us to sing, or we didn't, you know, do something the way they thought we should do it. We didn't have the Bible study they thought we should have or whatever it might be. And so they quietly say to one person or to another person and they, and they complain. I, I want to say something to you. When you complain about something that's happening in church, most of the time you're complaining about something that someone gave you for free. When you, well, I'm just telling you, when, when we've had in the past, we've had people who complained about the music for a while. Now we asked that and said, be done with it. We're done with that. Don't, we're not going to have it. But the truth is that when you do that, when you're complaining about the music, what you're complaining about is people that come up and spend a good amount of time to come up and, and prepare for you. And when you complain about a Bible study that didn't go the way that you wanted it or that they didn't do the book study you wanted. or I, I'm telling you, I, I had somebody get wroth with me one time because they recommended some study that Lifeway had and we didn't do it. Like they were mad because we, we just didn't do the thing they wanted. When you do that, what, you, what you're saying to somebody is when, when they're doing a Bible study, what you're saying is that... that you're, you're complaining about something they did for you because they love the Lord and they want to serve the Lord. Paul said there's a better way. You ready? Instead of being angry about what didn't happen or what you wanted, Paul said this, recognize those who labor among you. And then he gave another one. Not only those who labor among you, but those who are over you in the Lord. Those who, I like this one, those who admonish you. That's interesting because Paul did not say what we would like in the, in the typical American church culture, culture. What would we really want there? We'd want edify. Like you, should, you should, yeah, encourage. You should, you should be happy with those. You should esteem those who encourage you. You should esteem those who edify you. That's what American church wants. But what did Paul say? No, he said highly esteem who? The ones who admonish. That's the ones who would correct you. It's interesting. I, I have to correct people sometimes in church. It's just part of the role. And it's interesting. Whenever I have to correct somebody and whenever someone else has to be with me, whether Sherry's been with me or Tom's been with me or Jeff's been with me or whoever, somebody's been with me and, I, and I've had to go correct somebody. Do you know what 100% of the people have always said to me when we have to go talk to somebody? I don't want to do this. Have you ever think from the other side that when a church has to tell you, no, we're not going to do that, or we're not going to do it your way, or you can't do that, or you have to stop doing that, or whatever, have you ever thought to yourself that from the other side, do you think the church enjoys, do you think like I enjoy that? Is that a comfortable day to have to go to somebody and say, you, we don't do that in our church, and if you're going to be a part of us, you can't do that? I want you to think about that. Dan, you, you know this. You talked with me about that. That's an uncomfortable scenario to be into. I want to tell you something interesting that happened. <coughs> It's kind of a twofold thing. This lady, um, well, I should just, let me just preface this. Let me get everything straight so everybody knows where we are. At our church, we believe what the Bible says. Amen. And so at our, I'm going to give you the long and short of this without getting into a huge long thing. And listen, here's what it goes to, I'm, because it's going to go with the story I'm about to tell you. In our church, we don't believe that women can be pastors or deacons. They just can't. That's biblical. If you don't like that, you, you'll have to take it up with the Lord. I didn't write it. Paul did. So... 
that's what we usually tell them, that women are not to be deacons and they're not to be pastors. And that's what we believe. That's what we ascribe to in our church because that's what the Bible says. So I, I'm going to go invite this lady. She's a designer. She's been coming into our store, our fabric store, and she's been buying stuff. And so I had set my sights on inviting her and her family to church. And so I said, the next time she comes in, I'm going to invite her to church. And so I did. And she immediately started to jump my case about churches. Why? Her sole reasoning was because, now remember, this lady's an atheist, by the way, I didn't say that, but this lady's a total atheist. But she was angry because the church, churches that she had known, would not allow women to be pastors or deacons. And even more so, then she had to look me right in the face and say, does your church allow women to be pastors or deacons? <laughs> this is going to be awkward for an invitation conversation, but whatever. <laughs> so I told her that, no, we didn't, and she was very wroth with me. And interestingly enough, that following Wednesday, I think it was a Wednesday night, we were having a study, and guess what came up in the study? It was about women not usurping authority over the men in the church. And I thought to myself, I already had it out with this other lady. I do not want to. Sometimes our Bible study, sometimes it's like all ladies and me and Tom. <laughs> and so like that's, I'm pretty sure that's what it was that night. It was just all ladies in there. I'll tell you this, Tom's, Tom came to me. He always reads ahead on me. Tom came to me, and he goes, I read what you have to talk about today, and here's what he said. <laughs> and so I thought to myself, I thought, oh, my, I'm going to say this. And they're just like, I thought it was going to be this huge argument, but I didn't. I just went on and taught the word for what the word said. And when we got done with the study that night, here's what all the ladies in the room said when they were done. They all said this. They said, I'm so glad that you were willing to teach on that and that you didn't shy away from it because you were in a room full of women. Listen, you should. You want to be happy in church? You should esteem those who admonish you. You should esteem those who have the guts to actually be in leadership in a church. That's not an easy thing. And I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying to you is that there's a lot of hard parts of that that you don't have to see because you're on the other side of it. And Paul said this. He said, listen, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. To esteem them, I'm in verse 13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now, if your Bible is like mine, there's a break there. There's like a paragraph break and it looks like it goes down to another verse. You know that's added after the fact. Paul didn't write it that way. Look at what he says next. Be at peace among yourselves. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be at peace among yourselves? Well, I believe he tells you in, starting in verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue that which is good. That, pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Be at peace among yourselves. And the first thing he says about be at peace among yourselves. Now imagine this. The church that Paul had only been at for three weeks, he's writing to them to try to, he, he's t trying to encourage them. And he says, look, here's what we want you to do. When it comes to your laborers and your leaders, we want you to esteem them and to recognize them. And here's what you do. You want to be happy in church? Be at peace among yourselves. Here's one way to do it. You ready? In verse 14, this is a hard one, but think about what he says. Now we exhort you, brethren, to warn those who are unruly. He's talking to you. He's talking to... When, when you as the church body stand together unified and say, you know what, we, we stand for this or we don't stand for that, and we stand unified with each other, that speaks volumes to the rest of the world. And what Paul says is this, if there's someone who's unruly among you, warn them. Tell them. You know, the Bible speaks often about you, the brethren, the body... Speaking with each other when someone is mixed up in sin or unrighteousness, that you would go to them and you would talk with them about it. I think, honestly, one of the most unloving things the church has, has done in the past 25 years is we've stopped warning anyone. We, we just, we permit it. Like, we, we allow the sin, we ignore it, and then after we ignore it, then we start to permit it. And then what happens? After you've ignored it and then you've permitted it, then what do you do? Well, you start to encourage it. And then even worse than that, what's the church started to do? Now the church has jumped in with the rest of society and they've started to, not only do they encourage it, but actually they celebrate it. 
And I'll tell you, even worse than that is when, when the church gets to the, like the rest of the world and when someone is mixed up in sin, that not only do we celebrate it, but if someone else points it out, then we point the finger at that person and say that that person was wrong for saying anything. You know, actually, the most loving thing you can do is to warn someone because the Bible says that we're going to give an account for every idle word. Ooh. Like, when I think about that one and... and I mean, you're going to give an account for everything. The Bible says that you're going, to, you're going to stand before the Lord and you're going to give an account. And for me to not warn, for you to not warn someone that that's what the scriptures say. No, truthfully, if you, want to be, if you want to be at peace in church, we ought, to be, we ought to love each other enough to say, oh, wait a second. Like, we don't do that here or the Bible says it against that. Notice that Paul did not say, drag them before the church and, and church them and stone them. You don't actually, I'm going to just be clear for a second, like you need to know this, like as church members, you don't actually have authority to do that. Like you don't have the authority to drag somebody before the church. You don't have the authority to take someone's membership away. You don't have the authority to kick someone out or any of that. That's not even what Paul said. All Paul said was this, warn them. Not, not warn them all that the church is going to ostracize you. No, warn them that that's not the way a Christian lives. This was a, think about the scenario. This is a new church, people who, who are in the, in the midst of the church. What I, can I tell you something? You know what I found? Many times when people are acting unruly, you know what I've seen from my, my experience? Many times those people didn't really realize it was a problem. A lot of times when I go to them and I talk with them, they, they just, they're unchurched or they didn't know or they didn't grow up in church or what, and they just didn't know that that was unacceptable. And when you go and you correct them and you say, well, wait a second, like we, do, we don't do that. You know, we don't, we don't, I'm, I'm going to use some examples. When you go to someone and you say, wait a minute, like we're Christians. We don't, we don't live together before we're married because we're Christians. I'm telling you, I've been in that scenario and looked at somebody right in the face and said, you know that that's, according to the Bible, that that's sinful. And you know what, you know what I've heard people look at me and say? I, I didn't know that that, I didn't, I didn't know. I just thought that that was like the next step. Like we're dating and, and now we're supposed to live together. You know, a lot of times people don't even know. And even more so, what I, what I found is that a lot of times you all know more than what I know. Like a lot of people are like, what, what's going on in church? I'm like, you probably know as much as I do. Y'all think I have some special knowledge. I don't have some special knowledge. Half the time y'all hide stuff from me. Like I, <laughs> I find out. I was, I was referencing like the other week when y'all gave me a gift. That's what I meant. That's, <laughs> look, I got to show you this. Verse, uh, I'm in verse 14. We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, and then this, comfort the faint-hearted. Now, faint-hearted, that doesn't mean weak. He, he addresses the weak here in a second. He says the faint-hearted, those who are faint of heart, those who have lost heart, those who are hurting. Can I remind you of something about church for a moment? Because I'm right about this one. Many times people come into church, the people who come here are here because they're faint-hearted. Whether anybody wants to admit this, or I, I don't mean like church people, I mean like the world, the culture. The culture wants to act like the church is, is irrelevant and the culture wants to act like you know, who needs the church or what good does the church do. But I'll tell you this, let someone really start hurting. Their wife has left them, the cancer's back, the surgery is coming, the, someone has passed or whatever it might be. When that happens, you know what my experience has been? Guess the first place, that, the first place they come. It is still known in the culture you live in that the church is the place to go when you're hurting, that there could be help there. And so people, when they're hurting, they come here. And Paul says this. He said, look, you want to be at peace in church? You want to be happy in your church? Comfort the faint-hearted. Comfort them. Can I remind you of something else? Don't take this the wrong way. Really hear what I'm saying. You're not the only one that's hurting. In the church, what happens is this. But you're hurting, and because you're hurting from whatever thing you're going through, inside of church or outside of church, you're hurting from something, and someone else comes in and they're hurting, but you're not paying attention because, because of your own hurt. Listen, I want you to know that a good chunk of people who come to church are coming because they're faint-hearted, because they're hurt. And you're not the only one. Everybody has their own thing going. If you haven't lost someone, then you might have lost all your income or you might have lost all your money. You might be having financial problems. If you don't have financial problems, maybe you're having trouble with your kids or whatever it might be. You're having your own things, but don't forget the people beside you and behind you and in front of you. Those people are, are they're hurting too. And look what he says. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. You know, Paul actually talks about that too earlier. Well, I guess later when he's writing, but physically in the Bible earlier when you were in Romans, you know, he talks about that as well, doesn't he? That we strive with the weaker brother. 
my brother, um, my brother's a karate guy. Whatever you feel about karate or what don't, I'm not trying to get into that. I'm just, it's, it's an illustration. Don't get all riled up. My brother's a, my brother's a karate guy, and uh, he does, he, he's a fighter. And his style of karate is, it's not really a joke. Like, they're, they're serious. They, they, his slogan is, we, this is bad grammar for you, we don't play fight. That's his, uh, that's his slogan. I know all the grammarians are like, oh, they bristle. <laughs> but that's his slogan. Like, and he's not playing. It's like a, it's like a kickboxing type of, of karate. My brother, at 16 years old, he ha- held a world record for a while of kicking with his shin, kicking through two Louisville baseball bats with his shin. Uh, yeah, I, and I'm not talking like I'm not I'm, I'm not talking like a flat-footed. I'm talking with the side of his leg. He kicks the two of them when he was 16 years old. He's he's not a joke. And uh, anyways, um, so a little later in life, he has his second degree black belt. He has a gym. He's he's he went to Japan and studied in Japan. And and uh, you know now he's back in the United States. If anybody knows his let's call it his craft, he knows it. Okay. My brother and I don't always see eye to eye, but I wouldn't mess with him. <laughs> so, <laughs> listen, like he knows his stuff. And my brother is standing there, and this, this guy that we know, I, I had a, my oldest adopted daughter. She was about 12 years old, and we were having a, she's having a sleepover, and her friend is over. Her friend was 11 or 12 years old, and uh, her dad was there dropping her off, and my brother was there. You know, there was like a big party thing, and everybody's there. And, and this guy looks at my brother in all seriousness, puffs his chest out, and he goes, my daughter's got a black belt. Now, I just want to ask you something. Do you think that in any way, do you think my brother assumed the fighting position at his daughter? Did in any way, did he, did he feel threatened by the 12-year-old girl? No, listen, get, you'll get what I'm saying in just a second. Did the little girl, when, his dad, when, when her dad said that, she literally did like a back kick and like a couple of punches. And you know what my brother said? He said, well, good job. And he put his hand up and he gave her a high five and he said, that was good. He didn't have to knock her down because he's like, I mean, they're, they're both black belts. And this guy, what he's doing is kind of demeaning my brother's black belt in karate. But, but my brother didn't have anything to prove to the little girl. Like, he didn't have to knock her over. He didn't have to fight her. He didn't have to, like, there was no competition there. She throws a couple of punches and kicks, and he gave her a high five and said, good job. Because she was a 12-year-old girl, and if she had kicked him, she'd have just bounced right off of him. It wouldn't have mattered. Like, her black belt was not going to defend herself against a mid-20s, 180-pound guy. It, it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to, there was no competition there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Paul said this, look, look, strengthen, uphold those who are weak. Listen, Ch- Sherry used to say it this way. She was very right when she used to tell me that the church has a history of shooting its wounded. And that's a true statement. Listen, we're, there, there's going to be weak people who are going to come into church. They're going to be weak-minded. They're going to be weak spiritually. Are you ready for this one? They're going to be weak Christians. They're not going to be strong Christians. And our job is not to knock them over and let them know how dumb their doctrine is or how foolish they are or how, you know, the, how unfaithful they've been or whatever it is. Our job is actually to uphold them, to strengthen them, to strive with them. Interestingly enough, I have no idea what time it is. I've got time. Good. Uh, listen. What I found in church is this. Usually the weakest brothers think they're the strongest. Have you ever noticed this one? Have you ever seen this one? The people who are like the weakest, they don't realize they're the weakest. They think they've got it all figured out. They think they've got the Bible figured out. And, and really they don't. They're, they're the weaker brother. They get upset easily. They get mad easily. They leave easily. And Paul said this. He said, uphold them, strengthen them. Your job's not to fight with them. Look, I've got to keep going because I want to get through these. Look what he says next. Be patient with all. Be patient with all. Man, we've, we've lost that, haven't we? Like the, the idea of, of being patient with somebody for the sole reason that we love them, that we care about them. We should be patient with them. When it comes to the weak brother, you should be patient with him. When it comes to the faint-hearted, you know, sometimes the faint-hearted, they don't need help just once. They need help over and over and over and over again. And sometimes it seems like it doesn't matter how much you call or how much you visit or how much you give or how much you do. It seems like it's never enough. There's always one problem compiled on top of another, compiled on top of another. And you know what Paul said the answer to that was? Be patient with them. Be patient with all. Don't be quick to, don't be quick to, to push them away. Don't forget, guys, we're not, a, we're not a, a museum for righteous people. We're a hospital for sick people. Those who are well don't need a physician. Right? Those who are well don't need the physician. Who needs the physician? Those who are sick. Who needs to be upheld? Those who are weak. 
So Paul said it this way. He said, uphold the, the weak, be patient with all. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Mm. Now, again, here's, uh, I know I say things and then it, sometimes y'all like, did Christians do that? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a story because I have them. <laughs> sometimes I go home and I write them down so I remember later. <laughs> Listen, the church has a tendency. Church people have a tendency to render evil for evil. We retaliate. I did it to them because they did it to me. There were two girls who were spatting in my former church. I was the youth minister. These girls were not in the youth. They were adult. I say girls, but they were like early 20s ladies. One lady starts bantering with the other lady in Sunday school. It's a true story. This lady starts bantering with the other lady in Sunday school. They start going back and forth. It seems like no matter whatever this one says, the other one has something kind of negative to say about it. So this one, the girl that's been receiving that, she made it a point that she was having a birthday party for her son, her son who was turning one, years, one year old, and she walked around the church in front of the other girl, passing out invitations, saying over and over again, this party is by invitation only, this party is by invitation only, this party is by invitation only. And she passed out invitations to everyone except guess who? The one lady. This is like an 80-person church, and she passed out invitations to everybody except the one girl who had been kind of getting at her in Sunday school. So you know what the girl, this girl did? The girl who didn't get the invitation? That's perfectly fine because she took her name off all the nursery work list and off all the volunteer work list because she was the one who headed all the people who did all the volunteer work and she swiped her name off of it and then that way when they were doing things then her name didn't come up and she wasn't a part of any of that. How well do you think that ended for either one of those girls? Paul said this, don't render evil for evil. We are not a people that is supposed to retaliate. Retaliating doesn't do any good. Both parties get mad when you retaliate. As a matter of fact, it's opposite of what Jesus told us. Jesus said if somebody slaps you in the cheek, you should do what? Turn the other also. If somebody steals your coat, you should give them your shirt. If they demand you go a mile with them, you should go too. And we, we're, we're okay to say that so long as we're dealing with other people. But when it's us and someone hurt us, it's not always easy to take the high road. But Paul said, don't ever render evil for evil. Don't, don't ever retaliate. Look, that's how he said it, right? He said, never render evil for evil to anyone, but always do what? What should you do? Pursue that. Uh, pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Notice again, I want to come back to, and, and I'm going to wrap it up because of my time. But notice again what Paul, how Paul brought this back to who? Is this the church leadership? Is this because the church leadership has been so wrong that people get unhappy in church or that people get disgruntled? No, he laid it on this and said, be at peace among yourselves. When it comes to those who labor among you, what did he say to do? He said, he said, he said remember them, recognize them. And for those leaders who were in your church, what did he say? To esteem them highly in love because of their work. When somebody's weak, we ought to uphold them. When they're faint-hearted, we, we ought to strengthen them. We ought to comfort them. When they're unruly, we ought to warn them. What Paul did was very smart because he laid, the, he laid the responsibility right where it should be. He said, listen, it's your responsibility. My mom used to say it this way. She was right about this. She would tell me often, she would say, Justin, in our country and where we live, most days that you wake up, there's going to be good and there's going to be bad. Like inside of your whole day, something good is going to happen, something bad is going to happen. You can choose to be angry all day or you can choose to be happy. And I'm telling you the same is true in church. If you, want to, if you want to walk into the church and find something wrong, you'll start, start a list, get a notebook. Like It's going to get long because we're all a bunch of mixed up, messed up people. And you, if you say to yourself, I'm not one of them, well, you've got a whole other set of issues. <laughs> Paul said it this way. He said, be at peace among yourselves. It's your responsibility when you come into church to not look for that which is wrong, but to look for that which is right. It's not your responsibility to come into church and try, to, try to, to pinpoint everyone else's faults, but to focus on yourself. And look at how Paul said this. I'm going to wrap up with his verses. He said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything do what? Give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Can you imagine that? The will of Christ Jesus is that you would be at peace among your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That you wouldn't fight with them, that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't retaliate, that you wouldn't drive certain people out. 
It's not, it's not survival of the fittest, and it's not, a, it's not a place for only the strong survive. No, for everybody that comes in, we're supposed to invite them in, and God wants you to be a part of that. He says that's the will of God in your life, that you'd be, among, that you'd be at peace among the people in your church, that you, would be, that you would be able to work among them. And I want to pinpoint one more thing as we close. That means that he wants you to be a part of his church. And I don't mean, please don't walk out here and say that Justin meant like he's trying to coerce me to walk forward and join the church. No, I, I mean join the church at large, Big C Church. God wants you to be a part of his people. And there's only one way to do that. And that's through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we're coming up on invitation time like we love invitation time. I'm not saying that we don't want you to join our church, but I'm saying that you understand that joining our church doesn't, that's not Christianity. That's not faith. That's just saying, I want to work with these people. Like, I like what's happening here. I want to work with them. But what, what really happens, what, what Christ wants is that you put your faith in him and then you'd be a part of his church. You'd be a part of his body and that he would use you in his service and in his kingdom. And that's what he says. Let's read it one more time. And I'll close with it. It's in verse 18. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you.